evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to the 95th live program on Orthodox Principles. We are back with Dr. Yogesh Joshi from Wrexham, United Kingdom. Dr. Joshi has been with us for two programs earlier, and this is the third program with us, and today he's going to enlighten us on distal femur fractures. Over to you, Dr. Joshi. Thank you so much, Dr. Gopalan. It's been a pleasure to be on your series. It's been a big um, privilege for us to talk to uh, everyone around um, in India as well. Um, today we are going to talk about distal femoral fractures. Um, and I hope it, it creates some interest with the different techniques that we use for fixation. Now, in the last 10 years, uh, things have moved on. And uh, we are just going to touch on the different aspects that as how things have changed and how to improve uh, our fixation techniques uh, in distal femur and improve uh, in the end the patient outcomes uh, following these injuries, which are devastating if we see from the patient's point of view. I'm Mr. Joshi. I work in Wrexham Milo Hospital in Wrexham in North Wales in United Kingdom. This is my hospital here. Um, I work in the orthopedic department. We have got about 13 consultants now, and I'm one of the knee surgeons here. So distal femoral uh, fractures is a challenge. And um, even if it feels it's a simple fracture, it's never the case. It's always there is some nuances about these injuries, uh, which challenges time to time. They're frequently comminuted fractures and intraarticular. So uh, there was a few studies comparing um, the distal femoral fractures, um, which are extraarticular. And uh, when they did CT scans on them, uh, they found that many of them were intraarticular. And more often than not, they have got a coronal plane fractures as well. So in a study of distal femoral fractures, uh, when they were evaluated with CT scans, about 38% of the distal femoral fractures had a coronal split fractures in them. So you have to be careful when you evaluate the personality of these fractures. More often than not, they are um, in elderly patients uh, who have osteoporotic bone, and that faces another challenge um, because uh, the, the implants that we have at this point of time are not perfect implants. And this can cause quite a lot of problems, especially with reduction, uh, as the osteoporotic fragments are very difficult to handle themselves and to maintain the reduction, especially if um, there is delayed uh, malunion, um, then that can lead to further problems with the knee joint itself, leading to delayed arthritis and poor functional results in patients. The aim is to recreate the joint function back to the pre-injury level and to maintain the alignment of the, of the distal femur. Now, this is a big issue because you know, the implants that we have, when we try and recreate the whole anatomy back of the distal femur, we find that to gain the alignment back, especially the varus valgus alignment to the neutral position, compared to the other side of the patient is quite difficult. And these are some of the tips and tricks we are going to talk about in the next few uh, minutes. So the goal of uh, treatment of these injury is to regain early range of movements. Distal femoral fractures can lead to quite a lot of stiffness, especially um, post-operatively because of the adhesions that forms um, between the bone and, and the quadriceps tendon. And this has, the only way to prevent that is to increase the early range of movements. And this can only be achieved by stable fixation of the distal femur. We have to restore the articular surfaces as much as we can, because that can lead to early arthritis if they are not reduced properly. To maintain the limb length and alignment, and we talked about it, the varus valgus alignment, um, as well as uh, the flexion extension alignment, because these fractures tend to have an apex posterior deformity, especially um, in the early stages. And if you don't correct that alignment, that can also lead to 
uh, reduced range of movements and stiffness as well as reduce functional um, functionality of the patient. Stable fixation uh, can be achieved. Uh, we will talk about different techniques to achieve that and then appropriate rehabilitation, especially concentrating on range of movements and quadriceps strengthening. So th there are uncommon fractures. They are about 1% of all the fractures. But if you look at just the femoral fractures, they constitute about 3-5% of uh, the femoral fractures. Uh, Docker, uh, it's a bimodal distribution again. Um, the elderly people have with poor bone stock can have a very severe comminuted fractures. And especially in these uh, day and age where we are um, doing quite a lot of replacement surgeries on the knee, they can get periprosthetic supracondylar fractures. And that's a different challenge as well. In the younger group of patients, uh, you have got high energy trauma, which leads to um, distal femoral fracture. And these can be quite uh, severe injuries, especially with bone losses and open fractures. So looking at the anatomy, it's quite important to create the anatomy of the distal femur. Uh, as we know, um, the, the joint line is about a valgus of seven to 11 degrees from the mechanical axis. And this is quite important to recreate the anatomical axis and the mechanical axis of the limb. So uh, we have to be aware of this when we recreate the distal um, femur. When we align the distal femur in a way where the joint line obliquity is different from the previous, then that can lead to quite a lot of functional problems. Obviously, with the fracture of the distal femur, there will be either a valgus or valgus deformity in the coronal plane. And that is depending on what the relationship of the fracture is with the adductor tubercle, because the deforming force is the adductor magnus, which is attached to the adductor tubercle. So if the fracture is distal to that um, uh, adductor tubercle, the distal fragment will go into valgus, whereas if it's in proximal to the adductor tubercle, it will go into varus. Similarly, in uh, the uh, sagittal pain, um, it can go with apex posterior, especially of the distal femur, because of the pull from the gastrocnemius muscle tendons, which, is, which are attached to the distal femur. Moreover, if it's uh, intra-articular fractures, uh, the two head of gastrocnemius can pull the two fragments separately, and that can lead to rotation of those fragments. So all these things needs to be considered when you are trying to fix it back together because at the end of the day, you are counteracting these forces to achieve your reduction. And if you know what forces are acting on the distal femur, then you will be able to achieve the reduction better. Um, as we know, the distal femur, if you look uh, through the axial plane, um, it is trapezoidal in shape. And as you know, the medial side is less oblique than the lateral side. And this is important because when you recreate it, when you put plates and screws in there, it's difficult to um, visualize this in two planes, especially in the intraoperative scenarios where you have got intraoperative uh, x-rays in line. So just tilting the C arm by a few degrees in, inwards or outwards, depending on the side, uh, you should be able to get, get an orthogonal view of these surfaces. So if you know what surfaces uh, are inclined to what extent, you should be able to get a better picture of what you're doing. Similarly, the lateral condyle is higher than the um, medial condyle. And this is also important when you position the lateral plate. So if you're quite anterior on the lateral side, you can perforate the condyle and go into the intracondylar, uh, uh, into the trochlea. If you're too posterior, you can then put the screw into the intracondylar notch. And that is quite important as well to visualize the whole distal femur um, as a three-dimensional structure. So the screw placements should be very strategic. As you see, it's quite narrow between the intercondylar notch and the trochlea. And if you, if you go through the notch or the trochlea, you can damage certain structures, especially the ACL and the PCL attachments down here. Um, <clears throat> Also to note that the posterior condylar axis 
uh, needs to be recreated if you are going to uh, fix the condyles into appropriate position. And that uh, has to be achieved. If you don't um, see the coronal uh, fractures appropriately and fix them in an appropriate position, this posterior condylar axis will change and that may lead to instability in flexion or extension, depending on where you fix it. If you look at the classification of um, distal femur, um, it is still um, quite standardized. So uh, this is the AO classification. So type A are extra articular, uh, and they could be simple or complex depending on the combination they have. Similarly, type B are partial articular. So it could involve the lateral condyle, the medial condyle, and the posterior condyles. Um, and these are, are the whole fast fractures that we call. The type C are intra-articular fractures with combination of the metaphysis as well. So the, it could be a Y or a T shaped, or there might be quite a lot of metaphysical combination with a single fracture line exiting into the uh, joint, or it could be combination of the joint itself along with combination of the metaphysis. And these ones are quite severe ones, uh, which we need to address quite um, importantly if you want to recreate the function back. Now, this is quite simplistic classification as we have uh, talked about uh, this in um, the context of tibial plateau fractures. These fractures can be a combination of various things when we try and uh, investigate them further in form of a CT scan. So in the clinical evaluation of these patients, you take proper history, always go through the ATLS protocol, um, make sure it's an isolated injury with no compartment syndrome, always um, make sure there is no open injuries around there. And patients will always uh, will complain of pain, swelling and deformity. Um, and always check for the distal neurovascular structures. There could be associated vascular injuries or nerve injuries that could have to be dealt with if, um, if they are present and that could change the whole management plan. Uh, femoral traction can be given by a Thomas splint, uh, which also improves the pain and the deformity. And it can also uh, give us better radiographs um, following uh, the, you know, for when we do the x-rays following the traction. A femoral nerve block can be quite useful in these patients in a &E, uh, where you can then apply the femoral traction uh, without severe pain to the patient. So radiology is quite important in distal femoral fractures and we have to find the personality of the fracture. Is it a simple personality? If it's a complex uh, personality, how to uh, then simplify it into a various components so that we can fix those components uh, individually. Now, on x-rays, you can see, you know, there could be combination, it could be intra-articular uh, extension, and always get a CT scan. As I said, you know, about 38% of uh, extra-articular fracture, which is evident in plain x-rays, could have intercondylar inter, um, extensions. So always get a CT scan if you have uh, a distal femoral fracture. It on, not only gives us uh, the personality of the fracture, but have got armamentarium um, to fix those uh, fractures. It also helps in planning as to what approach you are going to use for these fractures. And then uh, we can plan about fixating, uh, fixation of these fractures. In the axial views, you can see, you know, it's, it's not just a simple, a simple uh, fracture. There is a posterior condylar fractures, and these are the ones that can be missed um, by x-rays. It is important to identify these kind of injuries because then the fixation could be different. As you see, there is a fracture line exiting here, so the fixation should be anterior to posterior to fix these kind of condylar injuries. Similarly, you know, in, in, in a sagittal view, you can get an idea as to what different fragments are there so that we can um, help in fixing those kind of injuries as well. Don't forget the proximal femur. Um, look at the CT scans. You know, these 
patients could come through a and &E with high energies trauma. So you, they will have trauma series of CT scan. And they do have the pelvis included. So you can be surprised to find some injuries in the, in the proximal femur along with the distal femoral injuries. Also look at, you know, the proximal replacement surgeries. You know, if you just concentrate on the knee x-rays, you might miss uh, certain subtleties about uh, what is going on in different, uh, in, in the proximal part of the femur. So it's quite important to look at the whole femur. When you plan these uh, surgeries, you need to know what approach you are going to use, and there are various kind of approaches we'll go through. More importantly, um, find what fragments you need to fix to achieve that kind of fixation, stable fixation, um, and that will be determined. That will determine the approach that you are going to take uh, in the femur. Techniques, you need to think about whether you're going to do an open direct reduction techniques or a indirect reduction techniques such as MEPO. Um, reduction techniques could be various um, tips and tricks, uh, especially if you're doing an indirect reduction. Um, we need to make sure that the reduction is accurate uh, and there are tips and tricks about the reduction that we can talk about. The various implants available for um, fixation of distal femur, they include nailing, plating, dual plating, plating in combination with nailing, and distal femoral replacement. And we'll go through all these things uh, in a minute. So uh, the box standard approach is the lateral approach, where you go lateral onto the distal femur, you elevate the vastus lateralis of the lateral intramuscular septum, and you are onto the femur. Obviously, you have to take care about the perforator vessels. And then you can modify this open technique into a minimally invasive technique um, if, if you need to. And this is a work course when um, you have an articular reduction and you have to uh, attach the articular block into to the shaft of the femur. If there is no articular extension, then this can be used for just the lateral plating. Parapatellar approach, as you know, this goes medial to the vastus lateralis and it can go into the um, knee joint itself. And that will help into articular reduction of fragments. It has got better exposure to the condyles and it, uh, it may lead to damage the muscles, which can lead to fibrosis later on. That's the downside of any uh, intraarticular approach that you use. The swashbuckler approach is a modification or combination of the two. So you extend the lateral approach distally, and then you can uh, use the lateral approach into the articular um, <clears throat> uh, component, and you can manage the meniscus so as to deflect the whole vastus lateralis medially, and that will give you excellent exposure of the whole knee joint. And that is probably the workhorse of all the uh, in uh, type C fractures that we see in um, the distal femur. The medial approach is important if you are planning to fix a dual plating system. So if you want to fix a medial side as well as the lateral side, then you can use a medial approach where you elevate the vastus medialis. Obviously, you need to ligate, uh, ligate the, uh, the descending genicular artery um, on the medial side and then you have got excellent exposure of the medial side. To point out that some of the fractures of the distal femur have got extensive uh, lateral comminution, whereas the medial side is very less comminuted. And in these fractures, it might be easier to fix the medial side and then approach the lateral side with a sliding plate or a MIPO technique. And this will lead to increased stability of the fracture as well as um, biological fixation. Extensile approaches have been described. Uh, um, they are very, very rarely used. But you can completely detach the whole um, of the extensor mechanism distally and elevate it um, proximally to give uh, excellent exposure of the whole of the distal femur. 
Uh, MIPO approach is a modification of the lateral approach. Uh, so it can um, be used to slide the plate um, so muscularly to the proximal part uh, and then use um, uh, attached a jig to fix the proximal part of the uh, plate. The, the advantages of MIPO technique is more biological fixation, uh, wherein there is a good healing of the bone and that can lead to better uh, earlier healing, um, as well as preservation of uh, the blood supply to the periosteum. So um, the method of attack is to reduce the articular surfaces by direct reduction technique with a stable interfragmentary screw fixation. And once the articular block is reconstructed, then you attach the articular block back to the shaft uh, with various implants with indirect reduction techniques. Now, since we have gone through all the approaches, we'll just go through the anatomical slides just to make sure that uh, we understand what's going on. Um, so if you look uh, on the lateral side of the knee, so the lateral approach is through the iliotibial band. And then you go uh, lift the whole of the vastus lateralis from the intermuscular septum. Um, to get into uh, that part of the distal femur. Now, as you go medially, you can have an extension of the lateral approach all the way and uh, distally with the parapatellar extension. And then you can go through the capsule and then reflect the whole thing medially to get an excellent exposure of the whole of the distal femur. And that is essentially the uh, Schwarzbuckler approach. When you are doing a, a lateral parapatellar or medial parapatellar approach, you go bin, uh, between the vastus or the vastus lateralis or the vastus medialis and the quadriceps tendon. And that will give uh, the good exposure of, of the articular surface. But these approaches are done, used uh, for, uh, especially for Hofa's uh, injury. So as you go medially, you can uh, lift the whole of the vastus medialis muscle from the medial part of the femur. And then you can approach the, uh, the medial side of the whole of the distal femur. And you can extend the medial side distally down here to expose the whole of the articular surface on the medial side. So you can actually have a whole 270 degree exposure of the whole of distal femur. And that is quite important, especially if you are dealing with the intra-articular uh, kind of uh, injuries. So we'll go back to the presentation now. Um, so th there are different kind of fixation devices and we'll go through one by one a bit so that we can understand what is the principle nowadays uh, for fixing the distal femurs. So in 1960s, this was the condylar blade plate that was devised and that revolutionized the treatment of the distal femur. Um, and it has got excellent resistance to bending and torsion. Uh, it also preserves the bone. bone. Because it's a singular fixed angle plate, it was quite technically demanding. And this, if it was anterior or posterior into the fragment or medial or lateral to the fragment, then it can cause translation of the distal fragment. And that led to quite a lot of malunions. So then they devised a dynamic condylar screw, which was easier to use. Uh, it was in two parts so that you can uh, independently fix the distal part to the proximal part. And that was quite helpful as well. The problem with these kind of fixations were uh, they were, did not fix the coronal plane fractures and the fixation of osteoporotic bone was quite weak. So then came the locking place, which is now uh, the standard type of fixations for distal femoral fractures. They are the fixed angle devices. And because of the locking mechanism into the plate itself, uh, they lead to rigid reduction and uh, rigid fixation of the construct. Uh, so it improves the construct stability because they are variable angled and it locks into the plate. 
They're also versatile to use, so you can use it with open technique or a minimally invasive technique. And nowadays the screws are polyaxial as well. So if you want to change the direction of the screws, you can do that in the locking plate itself. You can um, use these uh, plates um, in combination. So uh, nowadays there is quite a lot of um, trauma surgeons will go for dual plating in uh, quite comminuted fractures, um, especially to improve the stability of the whole construct. Um, the lateral plate are quite stable in resisting the valgus force. But if there is medial combination and um, the lateral plate can fail um, on in load. And that's the reason they nowadays we are trying to fix these kind of injuries, specific injuries uh, with dual plating, especially in periprosthetic fractures where uh, stability of the construct is very important to improve the function and early range of motion of these patients. Also in very low transcondylar fractures, the distal fixation of a lateral plate might not be sufficient. And in these cases as well, a medial plate can improve the fixation of these um, injuries. Intramedullary nailing is another, um, uh, another fixation device that we can use for distal femoral fractures. These um, distal femoral nails are quite limited in distal fixation. Nowadays, they have improved the fixation techniques of the distal femur, where you can have multiple screws in different angles fixing the distal part of the uh, nail that can lead to improved uh, fixation of the distal fragment. Um, and hence, you know, if, if it's a fracture of the diaphysis, which is extending into um, the intercondyl region uh, or the supracondyl region, these can be the implant of choice. Uh, they are quite uh, stable in axial loading as well as resistant to torsion. Um, so these can be used as primary fixations in, in these kind of fractures. Obviously, we have to have a longer nail uh, up to the lesser trochanter to reduce the stresses on the subtrochantric uh, region. And uh, obviously, if it's a very comminuted fracture distally, uh, this can be a challenging uh, thing. In one of the studies, there were 17% reoperation rates of, of just fixing the distal femoral fractures using uh, a femoral nailing. So um, they have now come up with a combination of the two, um, especially um, by the limitations of the plates um, and the limitations of nails. They have used them synergistically to uh, reduce the complications rate. Right? So especially to improve the stability of the distal fragment. So if it's quite distal fracture um, with less amount of fixation uh, available over the distal part of the femur, you can have a combination of either dual plating or nail plate combination. The whole idea of uh, shifting the focus from single plate to double plate or a nail plate combination is to improve um, the stability of the fracture so that we can mobilize the patient quite uh, early. Uh, they can get out of the bed, they can start walking, um, and they can start bending the knee earlier to improve the function of the knee. And as I said, the nail is quite stable uh, in virus direction forces and torsional forces, whereas the plate is stable in the valgus directed forces. So combination will be quite stable in all the, uh, all the six dimensions of movements. And this can lead to reduce uh, deformity uh, later on. Um, People are also now trying to uh, move from fixation into replacement of the distal femur especially in the elderly patients uh, who have got osteoporotic distal femoral fracture. And the fixation is quite detrimental. And these kind of uh, surgeries can lead to immediate full wet bearing um, mobilization of these patients. And this concept have come from uh, the, the thinking that has changed in the proximal femoral fractures, uh, which we are now treating many uh, with total hip replacements instead of uh, fixed uh, fixation. And this is uh, gaining quite a lot of interest amongst the arthroplasty surgeons uh, 
um, who might be of interest to treat the distal femoral fractures. So um, watch the space. There are no uh, long-term studies for distal femoral replacement in uh, distal femoral fractures. So um, it's, it's uh, an option that you could consider. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Joshi, for yet another brilliant presentation. Uh, there are a couple of questions. One is regarding the nail plate combination that you mentioned. So do you yes. reserve the nail plate combination in for patients with a long fracture segment? I mean, a lot of combination and a significantly bigger fracture segment. Yeah, so there are two types of uh, ways to look at it. Um, now, in, in this country, obviously, everywhere in the world, there are proponents for plate fixations and there are proponents for nailing. So some people will nail any kind of fractures and some people will plate all the fractures. So this is kind of a middle thing and none of the uh, implants are perfect implants. So the lateral plating can't be just used for all the distal femoral fractures and you have to be realistic with that. Um, the proponents of the nailings um, also uh, have got limitations in fixing, especially, you know, if the, the fracture is quite distal, nailing at quite distal fractures with intercondylar uh, extensions can be challenging. And these are the ones that um, can be treated with nail plate construct. construct. Um, obviously, nail plate construct hasn't been compared with dual plating system either. So we don't know which one is better. But obviously, if there is a medial combination, uh, which is, uh, you know, can lead to a varus directed forces, uh, just a lateral plate is not going to suffice for it. Uh, if it's a um, periprosthetic fracture, which uh, in, in osteoporotic patient with a medial combination, that is also difficult to uh, address just by a lateral plate. In, in those kind of cases, you have to think hard whether just lateral plate and restricting the patient not to wet bear till the bone heals is a good option or to combine the lateral plating with either dual plating or nail plate construct is a good idea so that they can start mobilizing quite early, um, get the range of movements and have a good functional life. Because the more you make these elderly osteoporotic uh, patients um, immobile, the results are really bad. And that also has led to increased morbidity in these kind of patients. So the, the question uh, can be rephrased as whether a, a single plate uh, construct, a dual plate construct or a nail plate construct is better for them. And obviously in my hands, I would rather suggest to do a dual plate construction or a nail plate construct, whichever your philosophy is. So if I were a nailing person and I want to, to nail these fractures, then probably put a lateral plate in addition to the nail. If I was a plating person, then I would have, I would then um, propose the treatment of dual plating system. But there is, there is no difference, uh, there is no kind of studies which have shown that a nail plate construct is better than a dual plate construct. So either one might be a better one. Or I think there's the long-term data is just coming up because I think there are uh, there is a uh, paper uh, that was present in the OTA and there's another one by Buxi that looked at nail plate combinations. And there's some literature on uh, nail plate with respect to periprosthetic periprosthetic fractures. But uh, how do you think uh, inserting a nail in a periprosthetic? Uh, I mean, when you have a knee implant, how, I mean, does all implant allow you to put a Retrograde nail or uh, IMSC or BFM, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, so um, it's quite interesting, isn't it? So if it's a posterior stabilized knee replacement, you can't, you can't do a distal femoral nail, and in that case, you're probably better off doing dual plating. If you have a, a knee implant which um, has got a, um, a, usually there is a small uh, hole in between the two condyles. Uh, where there is a plastic cap, you can take the plastic cap off and put the nail. Uh, the condylar width of a, of a knee replacement is very, very important. And there, there, uh, there are various papers which has shown um, the different measurements of the different condylar width, intercondylar width of different implants. So you have to know what implant is there uh, 
to determine whether you can put a nail or not because some of the intercondylar uh, diameter or the length might be so small that you won't be able to put a nail through it. So basically um, you can put it if there is a CR implant and also you need to check with the company that whether this yeah. particular implant allows for a retrograde nail, isn't it? Yes. The other thing you need to be sure whether the patient has got a knee bend. So if the knee bend is not uh, 70 degrees, uh, then you can't put a nail in. You need a good flexion to put a distal femoral nail. The other question is, uh, how do you approach a bilateral HOFA? Suppose you have a patient with a medial a HOFA and a lateral HOFA. What is your preferred approach? So dual incision techniques have worked really well. So similar to the uh, tibial plateau where you now do dual incisions, you do a dual incision for the distal femur as well. And that works really well. And the whole part of inter, um, intra-articular reconstruction is good visualization. And if you can't visualize the intra-articular component properly, then you can't prop properly fix it. So if you are trying to get to the medial side from the lateral side, it's, it's very, very difficult and you won't have a good uh, fixation and good visualization. So better to do dual uh, incisions have a good uh, visualization of the intra-articular fragment that you fix, do an anatomical reduction and a stable fixation. And uh, do you prefer anteroposterior screws or posterior anterior screws? Anteroposterior in my hands uh, work really well. Uh, posterior anterior, I, I think it's quite difficult to achieve. Uh, people have done that in hyperflexion, um, but I, I, in my hands, you can easily do an anteroposterior screw. Uh, you can clamp the whole fragment uh, anterior to posterior and use it as a guide for the uh, K-wire and use headless screws from anterior to posterior. Okay. Do you think biomechanically there's a difference between a PA screw and an AP screw? Because you're if starting you have a... posterior. When you, start, when you do a PA screw, you can, I mean, if you're doing a headless screw, if you have a slightly larger diameter on the posterior side, you, you may have a slightly added advantage for stability, isn't it? Yeah, um, but most of the time you, you do supplement that fixation with a plate anyways. So um, obviously that construct, uh, if, if you feel that one screw is not enough, you can put two screws. I just feel that the anteroposterior screw get, give you a better angle uh, than a posterior anterior screw, which could be uh, perpendicular to the fracture itself. And then you can uh, be rest assured that this fixation is going to work for you. I am. I mean, I, I like to do this hofa with a PA screw. That's why I asked this question particularly. Uh, Dr. Joshi, uh, we have a Dr. Sintel. Yes, Sintel is a staff orthopedic surgeon in uh, Dallas, Texas, and he's. Uh, Hi, Sintel. Uh, Hi, Dr. Joshi. That uh, he's an alumni of uh, PGI Chandigarh. So Sendhil, Sendhil is, uh, has a lot of uh, experience in knee surgery, fractures, and Sendhil, what, uh, can you uh, take some questions for Dr. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so can you explain uh, your rehab protocol for these patients, you know, like after a distal femur fracture fixation, uh, depending on how you feel at the end of the case, stable, unstable, comminuted, how do you factor in these variables and come out with a rehab protocol? Yeah, so most of, uh, uh, if there's just lateral plating and I feel my I've got a stable fixation achieved uh, and there is not medial comminution, uh, then I just get them partial weight bearing or two touch weight bearing for the first six weeks. And depending on the x-ray after that, they start doing full weight bearing mobilization. If uh, I'm, um, I'm not satisfactory with the uh, fixation itself, so stable fixation with a lot of combination medially, and if I feel that it needs a little bit of rehab uh, or healing put, healing before we can start wet bearing them and to put them non wet bearing for six weeks and then followed by partial wet bearing or full wet bearing, depending on uh, the, you know, the healing capacity. In elderly patients, I want them to get up and about quite quickly. And in that case, I then use a different kind of techniques either dual plating or nail plate construct to get them mobile as early as possible so that it's a stable fixation and more satisfied uh, for them to get them mobilized early. That's great. Uh -huh. 
Uh, Dr. Joshi, uh, I think you have a lot of experience in the nail plate construct. Uh, what is your, I mean, you should have a large series already. Mm, they're, they're not very commonly done, um, Dr. Gopalan. So I don't have a very large series. They, they do come and go. So if you have a periposthetic fracture which needs uh, early mobilization, then those are the patients I select for those constructs. So uh, that I don't have a large series, but you know people in uh, trauma centers do have uh, a series of them, and um, you know few of my friends have done enough of them uh, to you know if to collaborate with these kind of uh, fractures. Central, anything from your side? Any? No. I think it's good. Very good presentation. And, uh, Dr. Joshi, the, uh, I just want to know about one more point. I mean, for the benefit of the readers and, and listeners. Uh, suppose you have a, a fracture in the distal femur with significant metaphyseal combination. And uh, it's gone. The, suppose the fracture, the length of the fracture is quite big. How do you decide on the length of the plate? And how do you decide on the number of screws? Yeah, so that's a very, very good question. So um, the, the whole idea of uh, minimally invasive technique is to uh, reduce the whole stiffness of the construct. So if you have too stiff construct, then that can lead to non-unions and delayed unions. Uh, so it's quite important to, uh, to have a very long length. So in the distal part, you can fill it with quite good screws to have a distal fixation. But in the proximal part of the plate, you have to understand the concept of screw density. So you don't want all the screws to be filled in the proximal part. So that if, this, if the length of the plate uh, of the proximal uh, fixation is about uh, nine holes, then you fill up say four holes in, in the proximal uh, fragment. So, reduce the screw density and um, that will reduce the whole construct stiffness and that will improve the healing of the bone um, and, and that's a very important concept if you're just doing a lateral plating with Minpo technique make sure you do uh, get uh, get a long plate and um, so that you have got a good distal fixation whereas the proximal fixation you still have to do eight quartices but you space them out so that the screw density is as less as possible, and that will reduce the whole stiffness of the whole construct. Yeah, this is a, because the reason I asked is even I used to do, uh, uh, I mean, the same with the same philosophy. But this length, length is always we because we have a fracture the distal part. We always get confused. Why do you really need such a long plate? The point is very important, like you said. You really need a very very long plate. And that is the key and the screw density to reduce the stiffness. I mean, that's very important because every time you do it, your threshold is very high to put a long plate. You always end up, okay, let's find a way to put such a long plate. So, but I think you should keep your low threshold and really go ahead for a really long plate and with the optimum screw density. Yeah. Because what, what happens with this femur, especially if it's comminuted, they tend to go for a delayed union because the, the amount of stresses that occur in the distal femur are quite high. And if you look at the whole um, titanium plate or stainless steel plate, if it can crack, actually bend. So you don't want too much bend either. So if you have too much bend in the plate, then that will lead to delayed unions. And too stiff a plate is also going to lead to non-union. So you have to have that middle um, gain, and that can only be achieved by reducing the screw density proximally. And do you have a pre contour plate for the medial side? Is it available in the market? No, I just use the reconstruction plate uh, at the moment. Because uh, I, because what is, I observed is we can use a proximal humerus plate. Yes. That very well fits into the distal medial femur. Yeah. The other plate that you have on the distal medial fever is for the uh, DFOs. So uh, I, I sometimes use those plates as well for the medial side. But a reconstruction plate, it, the medial side is quite interesting. So the medial side in some of the fractures, the combination is more on the lateral side than the medial side. 
So the reduction on the medial side is achieved quite easily. And um, that also lead to good alignment of the whole fracture. And we just need a mini plate to stabilize the small, small segment of the injury. Once that is fixed, you can always go to the lateral and just slide the plate uh, up and fix the lateral side. Uh, Senthil, any questions? If there are no more questions, we can wind up the session. Anything from your side, Senthil? Uh, no, I just thought uh, I'll ask uh, Dr. Joshi to kind of uh, touch brief on some of the complications for the sake of the viewers, you know, what they should be careful about post-op and, uh, you know, what uh, the, because, it's, uh, you know, non-union, malunion infection, things like that. So what's your uh, advice yeah. to the people who are starting to do distal femur fractures? Yeah. So one is infection. It's quite important to improve your results by reducing infection. Um, one is a technique um, dependent. So if you're doing a whole open reduction um, for the fracture itself, that will lead to high infection rate. So I, my preferred method is a MEPO technique. Um, you can use indirect reduction technique using uh, external fixator just to align the whole uh, fracture in place and then just slide the plate up uh, for a MIPO technique. So that's one um, tip to reduce infections. These distal femoral fractures do tend for delayed union. The best way to avoid delayed union is by achieving um, minimally invasive techniques. If you're opening up the whole fracture and draining the whole hematoma, compromising the periosteal blood supply, then obviously a union is going to be an issue, especially in highly comminuted fractures. I know um, many of our conventional uh, teaching was the more surface area of the fracture, the better the healing is. Uh, but in these particular uh, fracture patterns, um, it doesn't work that way. So I still feel a MIPO technique is better for uh, healing purposes. The other thing is malunion. It's very, very common. If you're just doing a lateral plate, the tendency for your whole limb to go into valgus is very high, especially when you fix the whole distal part and then try and fix uh, the, the proximal femur um, with minimally invasive techniques. It's, it's quite essential. There are quite a lot of tips and tricks um, that are available using indirect reduction techniques to improve the alignment. And it's not the alignment just in coronal plane, but the sagittal plane is important as well. Now, if you see, uh, because of the gastrocnemius uh, pulling the distal fragment into um, a, a flexion with the apex posterior deformity, um, if you just fix the whole femur in that um, deformity, the resultant flexion of the whole um, limb is going to be limited. So these are the points that you have to look into. The reduction of the apex posterior deformity by either a bolster or uh, some reduction, different reduction techniques is also important. Malunions uh, can cause a lot of problems, especially even if you're thinking about delayed reconstructive procedures like uh, total knee replacement after post-traumatic arthritis. If the alignment of the limb is completely wrong, then you have got different problems with these kind of uh, injuries. So it's quite critical to achieve a uh, good alignment at, at the first stage itself. Thank you. Is it, uh, any more questions, Sentinel, or shall we go end the session? Yeah, no questions from me. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Joshi, for joining us uh, for the third time. And I really look forward for a big series from your side. Your lectures have been so, so aging. And you are the, the uh, technology that you're using. I don't know, Sethil, whether you've noticed the technology uh, that uh, uh, Dr. Joshi is moving to an uh, anatomy slide in between, and he likes to show the approach in detail. Because if you have listened to the last lecture, uh, the post lateral side of the knee. We have gone layer by layer, explaining layer one, layer two, layer three, and within the same PowerPoint presentation. So that's something really new. And a couple of other speakers have also found that very interesting, and they have also adapted to their lectures. And Dr. Joshi was the first person to use that. And with the, I mean, it creates a lot of engagement uh, with the readers and the listeners. So thank you, Dr. Joshi, once again for being with us, and we really look forward for the fourth one from your side.
Thank you, Dr. Gopalan. Thank you, Shantil. Thank you, Dr. Shani. Nice meeting you. Thank you, Shantil. Thank you.